Okay, folks, we're actually here now. Uh, I've already done 10 minutes of the teaching. It was awesome. You just missed it. We just figured out it wasn't broadcasting. But uh, we're just going to start it over. We've already prayed, and uh, I hope your prayer time was as meaningful and rich as ours was. So we are in 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4, and as I told the folks here, um, I'm going to look at them more today than at the camera because I feel kind of lonely looking into this eye that never blinks. And I'd rather look at eyes that do with smiles underneath them. And, uh, and also, um, oh my, and Alexi's even getting in on the, on the job. But uh, I forget what else I was going to say, so I'm not going to worry about it. So here we are, I'm starting over again. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to read the first four verses. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Messiah. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Now, what seems funny about that is it seems like it's pretty solid food that Paul has given in the first two chapters. But if he considers that milk, uh, the meat must really be something. It says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Babies and Messiah, immature believers, cannot accept meat because spiritual things are foolishness to them. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. How does he know this? He gives us the answer. For while there is jealousy and strife or factions among you, you are, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? I gave you this, uh, this diagram last week, body, soul, and spirit, and described how we are a soul. But we have a body, we have a spirit. The body is sensitive to the physical realm. The spirit should be sensitive to the spiritual realm. And as we grow spiritually, our spiritual sensitivity should sharpen. And as we age physically, our physical senses can begin to diminish and become more dull. But we are a soul. Let me ask you a question. You've got two ovals here. What happens if the two ovals start moving closer to one another? The body oval moves to the right and the spirit oval moves to the left. What happens to the soul? It gets bigger, doesn't it? The question for each of us is, is your soul expanding? Or is it shrinking? And the way you make your soul grow is to allow the Spirit of God and God, the spiritual things to invade the physical realm more and more. And the way you do that is by surrendering the physical more and more to the control of the spiritual. This is what walking in the Spirit is. Physically, I walk with my body, but as I yield to God's Word, my body and spirit become more overlapping and my soul, my mind, my will and emotions begin to grow and expand. And I've met people whose souls have shrunk and shrunk until they're about the size of a, a pebble. There's hardly any of the person left at all. And I've watched others where their souls grow and their personalities and character flourish. And that's what I want to be. I hope that's what we all want to be. But I was just sharing with the group before we realized this was not... Uh, uh, going out on the internet that and this is just my own personal feeling and I really hope I'm wrong but I sense some dark days ahead and I'm not a sensationalist those of you who know me know I'm not and though when I was younger as most youthful believers are they uh, they want to know are we in then days we want to know end time prophecy how soon is Yeshua returning and I was very zealous in that way when I was in my teens and even up into my 20s. But then I realized every generation of believers for the last 2,000 years has felt that. That Yeshua is right around the corner. He's going to come any day now. And so I kind of cooled my jets and I began to just focus more on uh, and living the Word, uh, studying the Word, and leaving end times to the end times. But... Um, over the past year, I've just sensed a real shaking in the world. And again, maybe it's just me. If it is, just ignore what I'm saying. But uh, if what I am sensing is true, and I, as I 
talk with other people and read what other men are saying who I really respect and who are much more spiritually mature than I am. They all seem to be sensing the same thing, and it's a new thing for them as it is for me. And if I'm correct, then we need to focus on being spiritual people. Because the temporal things, the, the things that can be seen, Paul tells us, are temporal. They pass away. But the unseen things are eternal. The spiritual things are the eternal things. And we need to be investing spiritually in obeying God's word, being the people he wants us to be, not investing in the physical so much, but investing our time and our energies in spiritual things, eating the meat of God's word. Because this is our rock over here. And people who live on the rock of spiritual truth, of God's word, of life and Messiah, they are the ones that no matter how this world shakes, they're going to be okay. So I challenge all of us, including myself, to strengthen our faith to put aside the things that just don't matter and focus on the things that do. And if we do that, I think we're going to stand no matter what happens around the corner. Now I put down here uh, 1 Corinthians 3.16 because if you jump down a little further, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? The temple was set up in a very specific way, as was the tabernacle. It had an outer court, and that would be like the human body. That's the external. That's the part of the tabernacle that was the most vulnerable. It was just curtains, and there was nothing much uh, in the way of protection that they offered. And everything about the outer court was open to the, the weather, to the sun, the moon, and um, all the things that happened, the dirt and the, and the dust that would blow up. And it was very fragile. But when you went into the, the building itself, the first thing you came into was the holy place. This is where the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the menorah were located. And these are like the parts of the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. But when you crossed on through the next curtain, you came into the very innermost part of the tabernacle and the temple, and that was the Holy of Holies. The, the court was illuminated by the sun, moon, and stars. The holy place, like the soul, is illuminated by the light of the menorah. But the holy of holies is illuminated by the Shekinah glory of God. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And this is the place from which God spoke. God told Moses, I will speak to you from above the Ark cover, that empty space made by the wings of the cherubim above the ark. He says, that empty spot, that's where I speak to you. And God speaks from the spiritual into the physical. That's how he created the world. He spoke it forth. And that is how he directs us. This is why we must be spiritually mature. So we can know the things that are freely given to us by God. And if we're not spiritually mature, we will be soulish at best, fleshly at worst, and the things of the Spirit will be stupid to us. And we don't want that to be the case. Paul revisits this again a little later in the chapter. But um, he, he wants us to realize that spiritual people are going to be united. They're going to be strong. They're going to be one. They're going to be mature. But if there are factions and divisions, then you're fleshly. James talks about this. James, the brother of Messiah. In James 3, 13 to 16, I really like the way the concordant literal New Testament puts this. It says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the meekness of wisdom. Wisdom is meek. But if you have bitter jealousy and faction in your heart, are you not being arrogant and falsifying the truth? This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, it's soulish, there's that same word that Paul uses, it's demonic. For wherever jealousy and faction exists, there is turbulence and every bad practice. If you're not familiar, by the way, with the concordant new, literal New Testament, I'm using it to prop up my iPad, and I really recommend you get one of these. It is absolutely the most literal translation 
of the apostolic scriptures that there is. It's not very pretty to read because it really follows the Greek order of uh, the word structure and the sentences, but it is so extremely accurate. And uh, I really recommend it. I've come to appreciate this over the decades. And whenever I'm studying the apostolic scriptures, I find myself going directly to it. So you can find it, just go to concordant, type in concordant in your search engine, and it'll take you right there. In fact, you can read it for free online, but the printed version has a lot of extra gubbins and details to it that you don't get in the online version. So anyways, moving on. Verse 5, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Answer, servants, servants through whom you believed. If you go over to chapter 4, verse 1, he talks about this again. It says, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Messiah and stewards of the mysteries of God. So just in case you're tempted to get bored, I want to tell you right now that there are five mysteries of God in the apostolic scriptures. We're going to look at those five. And the word mystery, mysterion, means secret. There are five secrets that the apostolic scriptures hold that were revealed through Paul, through the apostles, and, and through Yeshua. We're going to look at what those five secrets are. So, first of all, they're servants. Back to verse 5. Servants through whom you believed, as the master assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, because they don't cause the growth. They just each do their own little bit, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters, they're one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Paul uses two analogies here to describe the redeemed community. A field where life and growth are to take place and as a building where we have to do the work of construction. And uh, I think maybe based on this is why Peter later on in his epistles writes about how we are living stones being built up into this like a living edifice, a temple, a home for God to live in. Your God's field your God's buildings. Let's pick it up in 10 and continue. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, or foreman might be better, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is King Yeshua, Yeshua the Messiah. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with, with gold, silver, precious stones, now what kind of building do you use gold, silver, and precious stones to build? That would be a temple. Or wood, grass, and straw. I just want us to think about this for a second. Each of us is sowing something in other people's lives. Seeds are small things. And all of us are sowing something. All of us are building something. And the things we sow and the things we build are made up of a, a, a long series of very small actions. I think all of us know the power of a small word to do incredible good in someone's life or to do incredible evil and damage in someone's life. A small deed can do incredible good in someone's life or incredible damage in someone's life. We t tend to be fleshly and only look at the big things and not focus on the little things. But spiritual power, as I've always said, is found in small things and smallness and anonymity. And that can be, again, power to do great things or power to do really awful things. I went back and... Uh, I was thinking of uh, Satan's words to Eve. Do you know how many words Satan spoke to Eve when he tempted her? Any guesses? How many words in total? 26. 
He spoke exactly 26 words. He asked some questions, has God really said? And then he, he made a statement, ah, you're not going to die. God knows that when you eat this, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. In Hebrew, 26 words, that's all. 26, two handfuls of words. And look at the mess the world's in now. Don't ever underestimate the power of your words and your deeds. You know, you can do a good deed, but do it with a scowl on your face. And you can do a good deed and do it with a smile on your face. And the facial expression, those little muscles in your face, make all the difference. Not saying thank you, or looking someone in the eye with a smile and saying thank you, and seeing them can make all the difference in a person's day and in a person's life. We read testimonies of people who have come to be real champions of the faith. You can almost always trace it back to some little thing some anonymous person did. And when you look at the great villains of history, you can often trace back the where they got off the path, some small wicked thing someone did. We're all sowing something, we're all building something, but what is it? So just keep that in mind. Now he talks about two kinds of uh, building materials that we can, we can add to this. There, first of all, there are surface materials. He calls these hay, or actually grass, and wood. Okay, these are my, my attempts at drawing plants here. All right, plants and stubble, just, you know, odds and ends. I know Phil, our artist over here, cringing every time I put this, this marker on here. Is that awful enough for you? Okay, stubble, grass, wood. Now wood has some value, but it's not gonna last. Stubble has no value whatsoever. Grass, well, animals can eat it. But all of this is surface stuff. And then you've got materials that come from the depths. What do we have here? Silver, gold, and jewels. These things are all found not on the surface of the ground. But you have to do work, you have to dig. And he says, what are you building onto the, the foundation of Messiah? You're building one or the other. Either the things you contribute are just surface things, or they're things that come out of the depth. Silver, gold, and jewels, these are formed, by, formed in the depths, the darkness, under pressure. What are the things you've been through? I look around and especially the, the, the older adults, the, the younger people haven't been through a lot of suffering yet. And I hope it doesn't happen for a long time, but we're all assigned a certain amount of suffering because that pressure and that heat we go through is what forms building materials that last for eternity, spiritual building materials. But the surface stuff, doesn't last because what happens? Go on a little bit further. Verse 13, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. What is the day? Isn't it interesting that in the scriptures, and you find this other places as well, that there's one particular day that is referred to as the day. Out of all the millions of days that have taken place, there's one day that's called the day. All other days are just practice for this one day. All the others are dress rehearsals for this one day. And it's a day that every single one of us will participate in. It is a day that every one of us our, our, the trajectory of our lives has taken us to this day. What day is that? What do we call that day? Judgment. judgment day. Now we have all kinds of ideas what judgment day is. There's a day where God just squashes each of us like a bug. That's not it. It's a day where your entire life 
your entire life is reviewed and revealed for what it is. Your words are played back. Your deeds are, are, are played back. And even your thoughts and attitudes, I think, are going to be on display. And God's not doing this to embarrass us. He wants to do it because he wants to reward us. And he's going to reward us according to our works. Now, we're saved according to his grace, but we're rewarded according to our works. And the word makes this abundantly clear. And for some reason, some believers, you ask them, do you believe there's a judgment day coming? Oh, yeah. And they're thinking about the people they want to see judged. When people ask me, do I believe a judgment day is coming? I say, oh, yes. And I realize I'm going to stand face to face with my creator to give an account, not for your life, but for my life and how I've spoken into your lives or how I may have been a stumbling block in your lives or been a a help and a servant to your lives. I have to give an account. For some reason, that day is so real to me and I'm glad it is. And the older I get and the closer I come to that day, the more real it becomes. But uh, some believers don't really believe it. It's part of their theology, but it's not down here. It doesn't cause fear in their heart, a wholesome, healthy fear of God. And without that healthy fear of God, realizing you're going to give an account, then your life may not be much account. It's the realization of this day that's coming that makes all the difference. Let me give you some examples, just some, a few passages from Scripture that discuss this day. We'll start and take them in chronological order. Job. It's believed that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It was written before Moses wrote the Torah. Uh, we're not sure, but it seems to be the oldest book in the Bible. In Job 19, 25-27, Job says, As for me, I know that my Goel, my Redeemer, lives. And at the last, or the last day, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. And what's his response? My heart faints within me. If you believe in a judgment day coming, There's something about your heart that starts to faint. You should skip a beat, thinking, this is real. This is actually going to happen. Matthew 16, 27. Yeshua says, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person. That's each one of you, each one of you watching on the Internet. He's going to repay each person according to what he has done. John 5, 28, 29, Yeshua says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. And when he talks about the resurrection of judgment here, it means not so much a reward, but as to a punishment. But everyone is going to give account for their deeds. Paul in Romans 14 writes, But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. People who are judgmental of others do not believe in a judgment day for themselves. Or if they do, they have a really warped idea of how good they are to think, I can judge you, but when God judges me, I'm going to be fine. But you're a hot mess. That is really blind. It's such a blind thing. Yet I, I've been guilty of it. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah, all of us, 
so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So as we go back to 1 Corinthians 3, let's pick it up again in verse 13. Each one's work will become manifest. The things you've sown in the lives of your, your families, your friends, your community, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by what? Fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Now, don't think of hell here. Just think of fire. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> it's like a, being in a shop class or something. You, you have a project, you finish a project, you take the teacher to be graded. So he takes your project and throws it in the furnace and it burns up. Ah, that didn't work too well. <laughs> you know, that's how he grades us. He takes what we've done with our lives. He puts it through the fire. If it endures the fire, reward. If it gets burned up, well, it was just hay, grass, and stubble. It didn't last. It wasn't, it wasn't spiritual, therefore it wasn't eternal. It was just fleshly and temporal. So we want to make sure that what we build is with spiritual stuff, eternal stuff. And even if you do a physical good deed, which we should be doing, make sure attached to that physical deed is life. Make sure when you do a good deed, there's life attached to it. So even though that piece of food you give or that piece of money you give, even though that after that's spent, after it's eaten and gone, the life you imparted to them stays because you showed an act of kindness and of love. You imparted a bit of Yeshua to that person. The money or the food or the, the help with a flat tire, that was just the packaging. But inside should have been love. There should have been light, a deed done by Yeshua through you. That will go on for eternity. That will impact that person for eternity. Long after the tire you've changed is in the scrap heap, long after the food's digested and gone, long after the money is spent, the eternal part, the unseen part, is the love and the light you imparted. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Can you imagine? We always talk about going to heaven, how wonderful it will be. But can you imagine that there's going to be loss there? There's going to be loss. And some people have spent their lives doing ministry or this or that or running a company or being a politician or whatever it is, they can just see it all go up in smoke because there's nothing spiritual involved. There's no love involved. There's nothing of real life involved. It was all just a monument to themselves. And that's not the kind of life I want. I don't think it is the kind of life that you want either. Everything goes through the fire. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. It's kind of like a person whose house burns down, they make it out alive, but everything they've owned, everything they've worked for goes up in smoke. I can't imagine anything more tragic than that in this world. And yet, it's going to be a very common experience on the day. Well, I know that sounds kind of like a downer, but it's just the truth. And I think if you want to live a, a rich and godly life, we need to live with the realization this day is coming for every one of us. And every day you're 24 hours closer to it. And we live with that day in mind. I think it's going to change the way we live each day here. And we'll learn to, we'll learn to number our days we'll learn to invest them. Instead of killing time, we'll invest time. All right, verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone corrupts God's temple, and that's the best translation for that word, destroy is okay. To pull down is kind of the, uh, the, the weight of the word, to pull down a building, but corrupt is how it's used most often. For example, over in chapter 15, verse 33, it's used there. 
uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And also 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray. That's the same word corrupt from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Messiah. So corrupted, led astray, weakened, um, kind of, uh, what, what, what's it called when uh, eroded? That's the word I'm looking for. So we want to be careful that our temples are not corrupted. And it says, God's, te your God's temple, God, if you corrupt God's temple, God will destroy him. God will corrupt him. If anyone corrupts God's temple, God will corrupt him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. The way we live our lives can be very healthy for us, so they can, it could be demeaning to our health. The way we think, the way we harbor certain emotions, can be very damaging to our temples. People who are grateful are happy and they're healthier. People who have a good sense of humor and laugh, we know that laughter is good for the bones. And the way we live our lives, the way we think, the way we spiritually are invested affects our souls and it affects our bodies. But people who don't really invest in the spiritual, they don't invest in God's word, they can have very corrosive thoughts, very corrosive emotions. Probably the most corrosive emotion you can have is unforgiveness. In fact, it's so awful, God does not forgive unforgiveness. That is an unforgivable sin. And until you turn your unforgiveness into forgiveness, God's not going to forgive you either. His blessing's going to be removed from your life to a great degree. And uh, unforgiveness is a horrible thing. It's like acid in your soul. And not only does it damage you, it damages the people around you. Um, so caustic emotions, caustic thoughts, and uh, bad decisions, these also make for a very unhealthy body. Stress. So many times the bad decisions we make can introduce more stress into our lives. And stress can also be something that ages you prematurely and causes damage to your body. So everything starts in the spiritual. It starts by feeding upon God's Word, not just bread, but God's Word. It comes with meditating on God's Word, learning to be still, obeying and observing the Sabbath, and uh, forgiving people, not holding on to grudges, not being judgmental, loving people. These are very wholesome, good things are healthy also for your body. There's a, remember the story of Achan back in the book of Joshua, it's in Joshua chapter 7. There's an interesting verse there in Joshua 7.25, I don't think I printed it out. But remember Achan made a bad decision. When they went in and attacked Jericho, they were given specific instructions, don't take any of the silver or the gold or clothing, you see something you want? Leave it. Don't take it. It's under the cherem. Cherem means the ban. It is not to be touched. It's set aside. It is something you're not to take. But Achan, his name means trouble, and boy, he was trouble. Uh, Achan, he saw some silver and some gold and a beautiful garment. He thought, ah, nobody's going to notice this. And so he took it, and he hid it under his tent. He dug a hole inside of his tent and hid it. So at the next battle, Israel goes into battle and they get whipped. It's a total wash. It is a disaster. And so Joshua goes before God and God says, Israel has committed a sin. Israel's committed a great sin and God was angry with Israel. And someone had violated his commandments concerning Jericho. And so what they did, they basically cast lots and the lot fell on Judah. And then they took the families of Judah and they figured out which family it was. They took that family and, and broke it down into the subfamilies. They found Achan. And they had Achan come forward. Josh says, what did you do? And Achan confessed the whole thing. He says, I saw some silver and gold in the garment and I took it, buried it in the tent. 
So they sent some guys, Aiken's tent, they dug it up, and sure enough, there it was, they brought it. And Joshua says the most interesting thing. He says, you have troubled Israel today. Now Adonai is going to trouble you. That's kind of what's going on here. If you are going to be destructive, you as a holy temple of God don't live as a holy temple of God, and you do destructive things that are damaging your life, God is going to come along and say, you want to damage the temple? I'll help you damage the temple. Achan was a trouble to Israel. God said he'll be a trouble to him. But if you treat your body as a tabernacle, as a temple, and you realize God dwells in me, his spirit dwells in me, that should be something that just makes you come alive every morning, but also make you fearful of stepping out of line. You don't want to pollute his temple. We want to uh, behave as people who are walking, talking temples of God's Spirit. Okay? All the lessons the Torah gives us about the tabernacle are lessons for us. And then verse 18, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, you got a high opinion of your intellect and your wisdom. It says, let him become a fool, a moron, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is stupidity with God. Does this sound familiar? Okay. And uh, yeah, a lot from back in chapters 1 and 2. For the wisdom of this world is, is stupidity with God. For it is written, and this is a quote from Job 5.13, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, this is a quote from Psalm 94, 11. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are empty. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life or death, or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Messiah's, and Messiah is God's. This is a fascinating statement. I know I've read that so many times before and never really stopped to think about what it means. It just was confusing to me. I thought, I can't figure this out. But I really was camped out here, and I find this to be a most fascinating statement that Paul makes. He says, you've been boasting. You've been boasting about this thing or that thing or this person you know or that teacher you like, and you've been saying, I like Paul better than, than, than Peter. And you say, oh, I like Peter better than Paul. And the other says, no, you guys are washed up. Paulos is better. And they're all arguing. And Paul's just saying, how oh, fleshly. This is what babies do, fighting over a toy. He says, listen, folks, Paul, Apollo, Cephas, the world, life, death, the present, the future, they all belong to you. They're all yours. It reminds me of that, those two statements. You remember what they are? One rabbi said you should have two pieces of paper. You put one piece of paper in your left pocket and one in your right pocket. And one piece of paper says the entire world was created for my sake. And that's what Paul's saying here. I'm here to serve you. Paulus is here to serve you. Cephas, God created the world so you could live in it and it could serve you. Life and death are things God has brought into the world for your sake. And even the present and the future, they're all made for you. But he says, but don't forget, you belong to Messiah. And Messiah belongs to God. So don't start boasting about the things that belong to you because you are someone else's property yourself. So that one piece of paper says, the whole world's created for my sake. But the other piece of paper says, I'm nothing. I'm dust and ashes. And we live in the tension between those two things. So up here at the top, I am nothing. I can't afford to forget that. I was a thought in God's mind. I didn't bring myself to existence, he did. I didn't choose the time or the gender or, or anything else about me. He did it all. He created the whole world for me to live in. He brought all of you into my life because each of you 
has an impact on my life in some way that I would not be as complete if I didn't know you. You were part of the furniture in Grant Luton's life. But should I boast about that? Mm -mm. Because I myself am someone else's property. I belong to Messiah. Messiah belongs to God. And in light of who God is, I'm nothing. And likewise, I'm part of the furniture in your life. I belong to you. You all belong to one another. You, you see the tension there? And when we lose one or the other of those pieces of paper, we lose one thought and hold on to the other, we'll either be totally depressed, well, I'm nothing, I'm just trash, I'm scum, or, man, everything's for me. I am on top of the world. You understand? Those are two dangerous extremes. But to realize that you are God's idea, he's got a plan for you. And though you belong to him, all of this belongs to you. And you're on a journey. It's, a, it's a, you know, an amazing adventure. And the part of that, the, the purpose of that adventure is so that you can be a friend of God, become part of his bride, and enjoy an amazing eternity with him. It's quite a thought. But we need to hold those two thoughts, or two arms of the menorah. We must keep them in balance at all, thing, at all times. Chapter 4. Now, I warned you earlier that when we get to chapter 4, you're going to think there's not enough time to do chapter 4. We're going to go very quickly through 4, and we won't take as much time with it as with 3, except for verse 1. This is how one should regard us as servants of Messiah and stewards of the mysteries of God. Three Greek words here that we need to know. First one, superetes. Superetes. This is the word for servant. You've heard the word hyper. Someone's hypersensitive or hyperactive. This is the opposite. This is hooper. This is under. Hyper means over. Hooper means under. And retes means a rower. So it really means I'm an under rower. In the ancient world, the Romans had battleships. Why did I put ancient Roman? I'm sorry. I think of the Roman world and I put, okay, rower. There we go. <laughs> and they had these, these battleships and they would have oarsmen on the top deck with their oars sticking way out in the water. And there'd be another deck below them with more oars out in the water. He says, I'm just an oarsman down on the bottom level of the boat. This thing sinks, I'm going down with it. These were galley slaves. They were chained to their benches. So if the ship sank, they all drowned with it. That'd be a motivator to row faster, wouldn't it? So he says, I'm an under rower. I am a servant. The next word, oikonomos, means a steward. It comes to the word oikos, which means house and namas, which means law. The word deuteronomy is didero namas. Ditto is where it means a repeat. Namas means law. So deuteronomy, ditto nomas, didero nomas means repetition of the Torah, repetition of the law. Oikonomas means house law, because the steward, he was the, you might call him the governor of the house or the manager of the house. The house manager. And then the last one here, musterion. That's why they translate it mystery, because mystery comes from the word musterion. The only problem is musterion does not mean mystery. It means secret. Over time, as translators saw that word, oh, we'll just translate it into its, what they thought was an English equivalent, but it's not. Whenever you see the word mystery in the, he, in the uh, apostolic scriptures, it means a secret. So, he says, we should be regarded as servants of Messiah. How do you serve Messiah? By serving one another. The only way you serve God is by serving one another. There's nothing you have that God needs. Does God need your prayers? Does God need your obedience? 
Does he need your study of his word? He doesn't need any of it. He was just fine before he created you. He'll be just fine after. But other people need you to be close to God. Other people need you to be in prayer. Not just that you're praying for them, but that you are focusing and connecting your soul and your spirit with God. The rest of us need you to be prayer, prayer warriors. We need you to know God's word because we need you to speak it into our lives. We need you to be obedient to God's word because your obedience to him affects all of us and your disobedience affects all of us. The way you serve God is by serving his images. We're all made in his image, right? Serve those made in his image. Serve people. This is why you say you love God, but you hate your brother. You're a liar, John tells us. So we're servants of Messiah by serving people. And we're stewards of the secrets of God. Now, what are the secrets? Let's go through the five. Each one of these re deserves its own study. But here are the five secrets that are revealed in the apostolic scriptures. The first one is the secret of the kingdom. Now, in the prophets, we all know that God's kingdom is coming. But what was not so revealed is that the kingdom would be rejected. That the kingdom would be rejected. And Yeshua reveals this in Matthew 13, 11. Yeshua answered them, to you it has been granted to know the secrets, there's the word, musterion, of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. And you see in these seven kingdom prophecies, seven kingdom parables rather, that uh, you see some rejection. People miss the kingdom. In 1 Peter 1, uh, 10 to 12, it says, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Messiah within them was indicating. As, and it goes on and on. It talks more about this, this coming kingdom, but the fact that the kingdom would be rejected. So you can study on that one more yourself. Let's move on to two. The prophets also foretold that Israel would be blind. And we have a lot of examples of Israel's blindness. But the duration of Israel's blindness was a secret. How long would they be blind? Well, God revealed to Paul the duration of Israel's blindness. He tells us in Romans 11:25, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this secret, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Now, he's writing to Gentiles. He's writing to the believers in Rome. I don't want to be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. How long will Israel be blind? They'll be blind until God has gathered in the Gentile believers. And then when the Gentile believers become proud, like the Jewish people were at that time, the Gentiles become blind and God turns back to the Jewish people. We live in a time where the invitation is open for us to see, for us to serve God. But um, there may be a time coming when some people want to repent. And repentance has been, been taken away. It's not available anymore. It's just uh, repent while you have the chance to repent. Tim, yes, question. I just want to make a distinction that um, when Scripture talks about the Gentiles, mm -hmm. it's not talking about us, it's talking about the Gentiles. We are Gentile yes. believers mm -hmm. who have been grafted into right. Israel. Right. So when it says Gentiles, yeah. it's not talking about us. Yes. We were the Gentiles who have now become, yes, grafted in. And that's part of one of the other secrets coming up. Very good point. Um, just a, on this point, I want to bring up something. Um, that there's always a debate. Was Abraham a Jew? People say he was the first Jew. Now, he was the first Hebrew. He is called the first Hebrew. But the first Jew, well, that's iffy. He was a Gentile who crossed over the Jordan to follow God. So, all right. But now Isaac, you could call him the first Jew. And then Isaac was the father of Jacob. So Jacob definitely was Jewish, all right? Third generation now. But there's something about Jacob he had a twin brother, 
Esau. So if Jacob's a Jew, Esau's a Jew. And yet Esau was the very opposite, very opposite of Jacob. Jacob was smooth. Esau was hairy and red. Jacob lived in tents. He studied with his father, his grandfather. Jacob on the other, or Esau on the other hand, he just wanted to go out in the fields, a man of the field. He wanted to hunt and he wanted to kill. He wanted to eat. He couldn't care less for, for these other things. Esau, he um, didn't care anything for his birthright. He didn't want that. Sold it for a pot of, a pot of beans. And then he lost his blessing as well because the blessing and the birthright go together. And so they were complete opposite. So God reestablishes his covenant from Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob, whose name becomes Israel. And Esau is not part of that covenant. But what happens later, years later, 20 plus years, after God deals with Jacob, puts his hip out of joint, Esau and Jacob come back together and they embrace as brothers. When you embrace, you become one. Why do you hug people? You hug people to, as, a, as a physical representation that we're one. We're one. All right? That's what it's about. When you kiss someone on the lips, it means there's a deeper unity. There's a deeper connection. But when you hug somebody, it means we're one. And it says they, they hugged and they wept on each other's necks. They were brothers again. And there's a day coming when, and it's here now, because we have a room full of Gentiles who've now embraced Israel, and been grafted into Israel, become one with Israel. So it's an amazing thing. But anyways, we could talk about this all day. You can also look at Isaiah 6, 9 to 10, which hints at this. Let's go on to secret number three, the resurrection. Now, the Jews have always believed in a resurrection, but there's an um, aspect of the resurrection that was new. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 52. Behold, I tell you a, here's another musterion, a secret. We will not all sleep. In other words, not everyone will die. That was news. In Judaism, they knew there would be a resurrection, but they assumed everyone had to die first. And Paul says, I've got a secret for you. Not everybody's going to die. But we will all be changed. We will all experience resurrection, though not all will experience death. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. Secret number four, the time of Torahlessness. Your translations say lawlessness, but when Paul talks about the law, he's not talking about Roman law or Greek law. He's talking about God's law, the Torah. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the secret, there it is, musterion again, for the secret of Torahlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, who is the he? And this is where commentators are always in disagreement. Some say the he is the Holy Spirit. Some say the he is referring to the body of Messiah. I believe, personally, and I could be wrong, I believe the he is this, the Word of God. Not just Bibles, but the Word of God. That there will be a famine of the Word of God. I want to share something with you. came in the mail just this week. I get a newsletter from Perfect Word Ministries, which is a messianic ministry run by Kevin Jeffries. And Kevin has his own uh, New Testament translation out, which is very good. And I always enjoy reading what he has to say. So this just came again, like I said, last week. It says, This year showed me that the now rapid erosion of our freedoms and of our society as we know it is actually proof of our own steady erosion as the body of Messiah. Truly, we are living in a post-biblical world. According to a new study out just this year by trusted Christian researcher George Barna, quote, although seven out of 10 Americans, 70%, consider themselves to be Christian, just 6% have a biblical worldview, unquote. 
8%. That is half of the already abysmal number from just 20 years ago, which was 12%. But while that's bad enough, it gets worse. Among Americans in their 30s and 40s, only 5% hold to a biblical worldview. And among those 18 to 29, the future of America, it's just 2%. These are people who call themselves Christians. 2%, 2 out of 100. What kind of society can we expect to have? What inalienable rights can we hope to hold? What souls can we hope to reach when only two in every 100 people believe that absolute moral truth exists? to say nothing of the truth of God's word and the salvation of Yeshua. You can see why the shaking that I sense is coming is really going to shake a lot. And I'm shocked as I talk to believers who I guess just in my ignorance I assume hold a biblical worldview. They don't. When it comes to sexuality, gender orientation, when it comes to socialism, when it comes to um, societal theft and, and all these other things that are happening in our culture, they just accept it. Well, that's okay. It's the way things are. It's like, oh my goodness. It's like, no, that's not normal. This is normal. This is God's way. This is the way a human being is supposed to live. This is the handbook for being a human being. When we throw the handbook for being a human being out the window, don't ex be surprised we begin to behave like animals instead of as godly people. So anyways, the number five is called the great secret, and it's in two parts. The first part, and this is the great secret, compared to the other four, this is one that just kind of um, blows the roof off. The summing up of all things in Messiah. Ephesians 1, 9 to 11, he made known to us the mystery, the mysterion, secret of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. In other words, there's a day coming. And what's it going to be like? That is the summing up of all things, all things in Messiah. Things in the heavens, things on earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. We refer to this as the salvation of all, the restitution of all things, where God will eventually gather all the human race in to his will. When he's taken them through the judgment, when he's restored them, then all things, all people, are summed up in Messiah. They're all included in him. That is a powerful, powerful secret that was not revealed in the days before Messiah. But there's a second part, and that is the inclusion of the Gentiles. It's not just Israel. In Ephesians 3, verses 2 to 6, If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the musterion, the secret, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the secret of Messiah, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, and fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in King Yeshua through the gospel. The prophets in the Hebrew scriptures have always talked about God's grace to the Gentiles and God's blessing to the Gentiles. He told Abraham, uh, you're going to be, uh, your name's going to be a blessing to all the nations. So that was news. But that we be made fellow heirs equal heirs with Israel, that was a mind blower. That is one of the things that caused the Jewish people in the first century to totally reject Paul. They could listen to the gospel about Yeshua, no problem. When we started talking about the Gentiles being grafted in, becoming heirs with Israel, that's when they wanted to kill him. 
So uh, these are the five secrets. They all deserve a lot more time and attention than we have here. But I couldn't just let it pass without sharing with you what the five are. Okay, so now we put it in uh, high gear and we finish up chapter four. Um, in verses one through five, he talks about what's required of a steward and a servant. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse two. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Why is that? Because he has a judge. There's a judgment day coming and he's focused on that. So what you think of me isn't that big a deal because there's one who I serve and who created me. He's the one who's going to judge me. That's what matters to me. He says, I do not even judge myself. We have to be careful with that. We have a tendency to never measure and weigh our own lives, never really do inventories of how we're doing as a believer. On the other hand, we can be very self-condemning, very self-judging. There's a balance there. When you're aware of an error in yourself, fix it. But don't spend all day contemplating how horrible you are and how a, a waste you are. Don't do that. You're God's child. He doesn't want you condemning yourself anymore. He wants other people condemning you. So have a healthy, balanced approach to yourself. Paul says, he, he's basically saying, I'm not perfect, but I don't sit around judging myself either. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted because I could have something wrong. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light the things now hid in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart? Then each one will receive condemnation from God. What does it say? Each one will receive praise from God. Kathy, you will hear God praise you. Tara, you're going to hear God praise you. Naomi, you're going to hear God praise you. Can you imagine? What kind of God that is? But after all, if the Word incarnate could wrap a towel around his waist, kneel down and wash his disciples' feet. That's our God. And if you like praising your children when they do well, how much more must your Heavenly Father love to praise his kids? What a God we've got. So, Verses 6 and 7. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up. That uh, word puffed up is one word in Greek. It's found seven times in the apostolic scriptures, six times here in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be seeing puffed up quite a lot. Puffed up in favor of one against another. For who is making you discriminate? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So let's just sum that up. In other words, don't be a fathead. That's what it means. Don't be a fathead. Don't have, get your head puffed up. Because here's what they were doing. They were starting to compare and boast about what they had learned. And yet they knew squat. They were still babies drinking milk. And yet they're boasting about all the knowledge they learned. They didn't know anything. But their heads had gotten fat. They'd gotten really puffed up with their bit of knowledge. And he talks about this more, I think it's over in chapter 7. I put this down. In other words, why are you all puffed up about, what you, about who you follow when we, your leaders, are not puffed up? They were kind of like, you know, people, they've, they're wearing all the, the team gear, you know, all the... The, the, the gear and those jerseys and everything, but they're not on the team. It's like a bunch of fat guys watching a football game complaining about how bad they're playing when these guys can hardly walk across the kitchen floor to the refrigerator to get another beer. You know what I'm saying? He says, why are you guys all puffed up? So, verses 8 through 13. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you become kings. I'm going to tell you right now, 8 through 13 is just kind of funny and it seems kind of out of character because what you read here is sarcasm. 
It's pure, unadulterated sarcasm Paul is using. He's mocking these puffed up, immature babies in Corinth. Read it again with this idea that you understand what he's saying. Already you, you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we become a spectacle to the world, to angels, to men. We are morons for Messiah's sake, but you are wise in Messiah. We're weak. Oh, but you're so strong. You're held in honor. But we uh, disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. We labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. You guys, you're sitting on your high and mighty thrones, judging us. They were boasting, you know, one saying, oh, I like that Paul. He's got such a powerful testimony. You should hear him tell this testimony. Another says, ah, that Paul don't like him. He used to persecute the believers. I like Peter. He's a real Jew and he walked with Yeshua. And that Apollos, he's a Gentile. What does he know? They're, they're all being snobbish about which teacher they like the best. And yet they're not being like their teachers because their teachers are all humble. Paul says, we're the scum of the earth. People curse us, we bless them. We work with our hands. We're homeless. We don't have nice clothes. We don't make any money. We're just servants that you're boasting because you know us. But we're not boasting and we are the leaders. We are the ones who have brought the good news of Yeshua to you. We're the ones who are teaching the scriptures. We're nothing but you boast because you know us. In other words, don't be a snob. Don't be a snob. And then 14 to 21. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish. To admonish you as my beloved children. For through you, for though you have countless guides and Messiah, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father and Messiah Yeshua through the gospel. I'm going to tell you the summary right now. I don't mean to make you feel bad, but who's your daddy? That's what this section's about says, listen, guys, I'm your father spiritually. I'm the one who introduced you to Yeshua. I'm the one who taught you the beginnings of the word of God. And he's going to say here, so I can either come, I can bring treats, or I can come and get out the paddle. Verse 17, that is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Messiah, as I teach them everywhere in every community. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their dunamis, their power. When he talks about dunamis here, he's not talking about necessarily miraculous powers. Paul wasn't coming to shoot lightning bolts out of his fingertips. He's saying, I'm going to see if you're really living, if your life is where your mouth is, if you're walking the talk. Does it reveal itself in a truly changed character. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in dunamis, in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? So, chapter 4 is a very earthy chapter in some ways. Because you see Paul's humanity, even his sarcasm, he uses this with the spiritual kids. And, um, you know, the only time I see Yeshua really getting angry in the Gospels, really getting angry, and really just cutting loose and chewing people out is when he met hypocrites. Because when it comes to a hypocrite, someone who's very proud of what they know or think they know, but they're not living a life that matches, it's like the only thing to do is to do what Paul's doing here, to threaten to really come and have it out with them. Or what Yeshua did, and I'm not Yeshua, and I can't see myself ever doing what he did, where he met with the hypocrites and the Pharisees, and he really chewed them out, whoop, up one side and down the other. A whole chapter, pretty much, is just him really reaming out the leaders of his day. 
And he was angry. He was really ticked. And so that's almost the only way to deal with a real hypocrite. But I'm not giving you permission, and I'm not taking permission myself to ever treat hypocrites that way. But it's just interesting to note when it comes to proud people, puffed up people, that uh, you have to take some time extreme measures. All right? So just something to think about. It's not permission to go out and start chewing people out you think are proud. Because you might start getting proud yourself and I'll have to come chew you out. And I don't want to do that. Are there any comments or questions? I think we only went over about eight minutes. Yes, Brandon. Yeah, so in Jeremiah 31, yes. we know that you know, the Torah is written in our hearts. Yeah. Um, and I'm just kind of thinking about and wondering, you know, you said 2% of like my generation mm -hmm. actually has biblical morals. Mm -hmm. And so how is it that the, the Torah is written in people's heart, yet it's only 2%? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you have to take that along with uh, Romans chapter 11, where Paul talks about the redeemed community of the Gentiles starting to boast against the tree they're grafted into. So we're grafted into Israel, but it's tenuous. So we begin to boast against Israel, like the Corinthians here are boasting how much they know. It's like God gets out the saw. All right, I grafted you in, but I can graft you right out too. And uh, I think we live in the days in that we can hear the saw going at the limb. And this is one of the reasons I believe we see churches dying everywhere. And yet believers who are turning to the Torah are thriving. Torah communities are thriving like Beth de Kuhn. And uh, we live in a day where there's so much Torahlessness in society that those who do observe Torah are going to thrive, really thrive. But there's, there's going to be a distinction between those who, who observe and those who don't, those who treasure God's words and those who do not. So, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a world of extremes. It's a world of where there's light and there's darkness and nothing in between. There's righteousness and there's wickedness and very little in between. There's a polarization. It was prophesied in Daniel and in Revelation, this polarization. So you're going to be either those who are staying on the rock you have a rich spiritual life and strong faith, or you're going to be shaken because it says even the elect will, be, uh, will fall away. And um, so we need to make sure that we're really plugged in. We'll be in the minority. But I think there's also going to be great revival because when everything's shaken, people are going to run to the rock or they're going to run away from it. And uh, we need to be strong and stable to welcome them. Yeah, we need to be bright lights in this world. We can only do it if our minds are filled with God's Word. And we're living it out. So, yes, David. Just kind of a question or thought about one of those five mysteries. I kind of always thought of, of the veil as being a double veil at the same time. Mm -hmm. One over the Jews regarding Messiah, yeah. one over the Gentiles regarding Torah. Yeah. And that when they're lifted, they're going to be lifted at yes. the same time. Yeah. They are being lifted. It, they are. The yeah. Are yes. While yes. Are That's right. I, I hope, I, I mean, here. No, I agree. Yes, it's definitely happening. Yeah. It, it's, it's it's really a bizarre time we live in. It's an exciting time, wonderful time, but it's going to be a very painful time if we're not prepared for it. But if we're prepared, we're going to go through fine. We're going to thrive. We're going to be healthy, be strong, and we're going to impact the world in these last days. So. Let's be who God's called us to be, right? Well, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the precious words of Paul in 1 Corinthians here. Lord, so much of what he writes does apply to us. And Lord, I can think of Beth the Coon and think, thank you, Father, for a community that is mature, where there are not factions, where there's not condemnation, where people can agree and disagree and love each other, respect each other, grow together, serve one another in a bond of love. Thank you for our community. May it continue to be strong. May it continue to grow and spread. And Lord, I pray that as we meet in homes that this will continue to snowball in many communities, not just here in Northeast Ohio, but around the country and the world, will be strengthened and matured because 
They're making their faith genuine. They're practicing it every day, not just one or two hours a week. Make us the people you want us to be, Father. Help us to grow up into full stature to bear the image of Messiah in this dark world. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen.